we're going to have a look at some things to do with boats. Now, uh, there's some things again that I don't agree. I come from another background and I've visited a lot of places, especially around Europe. And I see some things over there and I don't see them here in Australia. I see some great things here in Australia I don't see in Europe. Why can't we have something that it just brings it all together we get the best out of everything? I don't know. Anyway, we are talking to someone that is an expert about marine engineering. Let's have a look. I have with me Joe, and Joe is an expert in marine engineering. Hi, Joe. Hi, how are you going, Harry? Uh, over the years, I've worked in boat construction, restoration, refit, design, and engineering. Can you give us some examples of some boats that you have restored over the years? I've probably done well in excess of 500 boat restorations and refits and built over 100 brand new boats over a 25-year career. Um, here's a few examples of some of the boats that I've done. This is a mid-1950s Halverson timber cruiser. We had to go through a full restoration process on the boat, stripping it right the way down, rescrewing every plank, making sure that the structural integrity was there, and then reinstating a, a good finish on the boat so that would be minimal uh, maintenance for the owner going forward. Uh, this is a Sea Ray 30 Sundancer. Everything was all old and worn out and needed a very good, a lot of cleaning, a lot of restoration work. The upholstery needed to be cleaned up and, and made serviceable again. We turned the whole boat around in just on two months time and basically turned it from being something old and tired to a brand new vessel again. Okay, now one of my problems is the marinas here in Australia, especially in Sydney. I think in Melbourne, have a look at some of the pictures you see now from Melbourne and also from, uh, from Brisbane. And what happens in those marinas and, and a lot of other marinas that have been around the world, even in Turkey or Greece or Italy or Spain, they have what we call, I think you call it a break wall. Now, how come here in Australia we have a very expensive marinas, but we still don't have a break wall? Now, you're looking at a video that we took at one of probably the most expensive marinas in Australia, and that's the Rascades Bay Marina in Sydney, Dalbora Marina, and have a look how the boats are just moving up and down. And you know what it was? A little boat, a little, a little teeny just went past it. It was about four meters, I think. So can you please explain that to us, Joe? Yes. In Australia, we have a lot of government departments and bureaucracy that get involved in environmental planning and they make determinations about the conditions and the construction conditions for marinas. Unfortunately, a lot of them don't actually identify the, the key issues at the marinas and they don't use any foresight to mitigate the environmental conditions that actually occur on the boats. We have a lot of waves, we have swell, we have wind conditions, there is no brakes for any of those things. You go to other nations in the world yeah and they've come up with engineered solutions to all of these problems. They can't see past a basic environmental issue, but they're creating bigger problems down the line just because of lack of forethought and foreplanning. Okay, now one other uh, issue that I have is basically the, uh, the moorings. Uh, we have here the, what do we call them? I think they call the swing moorings? Yes, swing moorings, which is just a basic apparatus, a concrete or steel block on the bottom with a chain that allows the boat to swing through 360 degrees on an open mooring. Okay, now can we explain here that if you actually want to have your own mooring, you have to apply to the MSB, to the RMS now? Yeah, that's correct, yes. What's the apparatus? It's just a block of concrete or steel of a specific size to be able to take your boat so you don't lift it off the bottom a piece of chain, a bit of rope and a yellow buoy on it yep. which identifies your mooring. It'll have a number specified for your particular boat and you tie your vessel to that which allows it to swing through 360 degrees. Who owns the apparatus? You have to pay for the apparatus. You also are supposed to pay for annual servicing of that apparatus uh, to be able to meet your uh, insurance liability risks. Okay. So basically the apparatus that's holding your boat, it's owned by you. But you are leasing from the RMS the space to put your boat in there. The waterways of Australia and the Crown have taken it upon themselves to take control over all navigatable waterways in Australia and you have to pay for the privilege of using not land space but actually paying for the privilege of parking your boat and occupying a piece of water. 
Okay. Now, when we just go around, we see a lot of boats that they've just been there neglected for many, many years. Uh, I think they're called uh, mooring minders. Is that right? Yes. Uh, we have a range of vessels and a range of different usage. And unfortunately, 80% of boats on the harbour and all around Australia actually uh, don't leave the mooring more than once a year. And that's usually just to get a slip and an anti foul and put back in the water. People have lost the time to go and use their boats and they just sit there as a mooring minder. Uh, and the average usage of all boats in Australia combined averages out to about 27 hours a year across all different usage types. Okay. Now, and it's also 23 days per year for the whole uh, boat. It's, you're, what you're talking about is the engine. Now, I, I, just, I just don't understand one thing. We have these mooring minders that people actually buy some old boat. They're putting there on the mooring because the mooring, it's in their name, they can keep it with the dream that one day they might get a bigger boat and they have the mooring because there is a waiting list for these moorings sometimes in some places for 15 years. I think in Rose Bay in Sydney, it's 18 years. And you have to be on the list for 18 years, and maybe that's the first person that will get it on the list. If you're number 20 on the list, you might have to wait for 25 years. And for me, this is not acceptable. And there's other ways. I mean, we can find solutions to solve that problem. But I think that the government, it's just like they're burying their heads in the sun. There is a system that we've seen around the world. You can sit down on your screen. It looks like a cross, but you can put eight boards in that. Joe, is there a problem why we cannot use this system here in Australia? The biggest limiting factor is getting the waterways to actually open their minds to the possibilities of alternatives to the, to the issue. So there is a solution, but uh, it's just that the government department doesn't really want to know about it. But the problem still remains that you cannot really get a board and get a mooring for yourself. You have to either get it to a marina or in a place just away from the, the centre of the Sydney Harbour. Is that correct? That's correct. I wonder if we could just use some direct democracy here and ask the people, what do they think? Well, should we just have this type of moorings instead of the normal swing uh, moorings that we have now? Well, since we are talking about uh, people power and people making decisions, like this little example, I know that you also are involved a little bit in politics. And I just want to ask you a couple of questions. First of all, what do you think about direct democracy? With direct democracy, we get back to the grassroots level of the de democratic process within Australia and interaction between the people and the politicians to be able to pass legislation and laws which affect everybody on a day-to-day -day basis. So basically people have the power, the majority makes the decisions. Well, that's correct, yes. that You have that interaction for too long, a bill is brought before Parliament, the pol politicians go and vote on those bills in Parliament and... We don't even know about it out there in the open public. We need to get the Australian people involved because decisions are being made that are not in the best interests of Australia. For example, in Switzerland, they have uh, the um, citizens-initiated referendums. Even the citizens themselves, they can bring a bill into the parliament. You think it can be done here as well? It can be done anywhere. Do you think that would be a, a good thing for, um, for Australia? Oh, Absolutely. It would be a new option and a new direction and give people a voice. So you believe that the wisdom of the majority is probably better than politicians making a decision? For too long, politicians on both sides in, in Australia have misled the people and quite regularly bills are passed which really benefit a really finite 5% to the right or 5% to the left. And the majority of the Australian people are completely disregarded in any of this legislation and a lot of these minority groups that are being pandered to, it actually is oppressive legislation to the majority and the people of Australia are, are being sold out by the government. You are involved uh, not so much with the political party, but I've noticed you have a Facebook page. Tell us what you're trying to do. Uh, Yes, Harry. I've got a group on Facebook called Australians for Genuine Change in Government. And this is a unification group which gives a voice and gives a platform and a stage for minor parties and independents who represent the majority of Australians with a general, general set of basic core values that they can come together, they can talk, they can work together and show the people of Australia that 
having a group of independents and minor parties in government won't restrict the ability of any government to actually lead the country. It'll be beneficial because these people will have direct interaction, direct uh, operations relating to all facets of government and have interaction with the people, the citizens of the country, to look after their best interests and actually represent the people, not representing the corporate interests as the major parties in Australia currently do. You're just trying to unite the small parties into one voice. Yes, I'm trying to bring together the minor parties yes. that, that share the core values of all Australians. Well, Joe, thank you very much. It was uh, very enlightening. And uh, I think we have to catch up again on another program because we have a lot more to talk about. Absolutely, Harry. There is so many things that we need to discuss. And as I'm trying to bring together the minor parties, if Australians sit down and we lay our cards on the table and we can identify the issues, there's nothing a bunch of Australians can't solve. Thank you.